nuclear plants can't just turn off, uh, coal plants can't just turn off, gas plants can't just turn off, and so wind gets a lot of, gets a lot of benefit af after that. Um, now gas plants have adapted by, by the, building these, these, these new kind of plants that can modulate their output up and down in accordance with uh, what the price signals give them, uh, but that's not very efficient either. Uh, nuclear plants can't do that. So that, 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 therein lies some hope for advanced nuclear, which do have these heat storage capacity features added to them that would allow for that output to be regulated and increased and decreased and maybe, maybe adapt to a market like Texas. But even then, you can't just keep subsidizing a, an electron that is, is inefficient and, and very variable uh, and, and can operate at a loss, basically. And so this, the, what this does is decreases investment over time in these other more reliable sources of energy and our baseload energy, and, and then you get the, the Texas freeze and you get Texas blackouts. That's what happens. Uh, and so you know, there is a ceiling to how much unreliable uh, wind power we should really be using, I think. It's not exactly sure what that ceiling is. I mean, but, but at, at the very least, we should know that you need at least a, to be able to power your grid with baseload energy only. And if we want it to be clean, then it has to be nuclear energy. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's definitely some hope with advanced nuclear. Um, and, but, but we need our regulations to catch up with it. Right, so it sounds like we, we all agree on the fact that nuclear energy is clean, it's safe, um, it's reliable, but it sounds like one of the biggest hurdles to advancing nuclear in the United States is policy, or perhaps lack thereof. Um, and so Maria and Rich, I'd love to kind of go to you as, as our, our two policy nerds in the room. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about what are, the, what are some of the policies that we can work on to promote more nuclear energy, to make it easier to build nuclear plants, to compete with countries like China and Russia. Uh, Maria, let's start with you and then go to Rich. Sure. Um, we had a lot in that question, but I'll, I'll just say, you know, broadly, what, what do we need to do to encourage nuclear? Um, and as we talked about, you know, it's safe. Uh, I do think we have to take a hard look at some of the regulation. Um, it's safe, but it make, we make life for nuclear a little bit more difficult, um, I, I think, than it needs to be. And so as you look ahead for some of these wonderful options that the two congressmen have mentioned in terms of new nuclear and advanced nuclear, um, what's going to be beautiful about it is you think of nuclear today and you think of it only as large um, and as these new nuclear opportunities come through actually head, uh, head nod to some of our national lab work, what you're going to pl see play out over the next you know, five to ten years is really the results of a lot of things that have been incubating in our national labs. They're partnering with different companies that are then bringing this to the fore. And it's going to make nuclear come in all shapes and sizes. There's going to be the middle size, which we call small modular reactors. There's real small ones called micro reactors, um, even smaller than that. Um, and so it's going to make nuclear feel a bit more, I'll just say, approachable. And I think what's important about that is that, you know, we don't just need to decarbonize the electric sector. This isn't an economy-wide effort. And so it's more than just electricity that we need. We need energy. And that could be in the form of hydrogen. It can be in the form of high temperature steam. Nuclear does all of that. And uh, as, um, as a congressman mentioned, you know, there's some challenges uh, with some of the other sources. But all of a sudden, if that nuclear plant is not only producing electricity, but it's producing hydrogen or it's producing high temperature steam, and it can do hydrogen at night and electricity during the day or whatever, it, it, it starts to make it very apparent that we have this nuclear energy source that's really able to provide a lot of different opportunities for us. So it's going to be really critical. And, and that's something that from a policy perspective we want to encourage. And, and I think we need to look at, you know, siting uh, these plants, especially as they get smaller. It should be much easier to site these. Um, and from a regulation perspective, really find ways uh, that, that we want to encourage this. Uh, coal to nuclear is something we also talk about. Um, obviously, uh, many states have made decisions that they want to step away from coal. Um, and I'm here to say I would love the talent that works today at our coal plants or that works at our gas plants. We open the, uh, welcome them with open arms uh, to the nuclear industry. So when I, when I ran power plants, uh, came down for a fueling outage, we brought the folks down from our coal facilities, worked side by side as we worked on the power plant. And so nuclear offers a wonderful opportunity for these jobs. So there's so much positive that nuclear just brings by in, inherent of what it is. 
We just need to make that sort of easier to tap into. Rich? Just to nerd out a little bit more, who in the audience has heard about the Energy Act of 2020? Raise your hands if you've heard about the Energy Act of 2020. Okay, so just a few folks. And of those folks, keep those hands up. Keep those hands up if you've heard of it. Who's aware that it's the largest climate and clean energy bill ever passed in the United States? A few, a few. And of those, and, and just remember, who was, the, who was the president of the United States in, in 2020, right? And, and who was in control of the U.S. Senate and much of the U.S. House, right? So the, the largest climate and clean energy bill ever passed in the U.S. was passed in the previous Congress, right, the Energy Act of 2020. It set up, you know, it, it's great that Congressman Newhouse mentioned the Manhattan Project. It set up a new project at the, the Department of Energy, which is the largest project since the Manhattan Project. So it set up a massive demonstration program for advanced clean energy technologies with nuclear at the center of that. It went well beyond nuclear to carbon capture and energy storage, a lot of other technologies. But to demonstrate exactly the kinds of advanced, much more flexible reactor technologies that Congressman Crenshaw mentioned would be necessary for a grid like Texas and Maria mentioned have all of these attributes that could help us decarbonize heavy industry and liquid fuels production. So that program is now a fully funded program thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So we are going to demonstrate multiple advanced reactor technologies this decade. One of them will be at um, as, uh, as uh, uh, Congressman Newhouse mentioned, one of them will be out in Richland, Washington at the site of the Columbia Generating Station. That's the X Energy technology, a high temperature gas reactor. The other one, further to Maria's point about coal to nuclear, the other will be in Kemmer, Wyoming at the site of a retiring coal plant in Wyoming. It will literally save that community. A coal plant and a coal mine were going out of business. That community would have become a ghost town. A new nuclear plant powered by Bill Gates's TerraPower design will go in there. Just literally yesterday, the Department of Defense Strategic Capabilities Office uh, decided that BWXT would be the reactor that's used for the mobile microreactor that they're developing for use in kind of forward strategic operating conditions uh, where we need really reliable sources of electricity and we need to get away from having to transport liquid fuel. So many, unfortunately, so many service members have died. Uh, or been casualties in transporting liquid fuels out to remote battlefield locations. I say all of this to say we're getting back into the game of demonstrating advanced nuclear technologies this decade in the United States, and that is an incredibly important thing. But just because we've gotten these programs started doesn't mean we'll finish these programs. They will take literally a decade of continuous love and support from wonderful appropriators like Congressman Newhouse uh, and his many colleagues who are supportive of this agenda. But the United States has a, a long and tragic history of going back and forth in our support for, for these programs and starting things up and then letting them go away after three or four years. We can't let that happen this time. If that happens this time, the U.S. will definitively lose the global nuclear race to China in particular and also Russia. And so I think all of our jobs as clean energy and climate advocates in this room are to make sure that that massive demonstration program set up by the Energy Act, funded but not completed yet, continues to get the love and support and care that it needs from the U.S. Congress and from regulators over the course of this decade. Those are great answers. Thank you very much and lots of work to be done indeed. Um, I'd like to go on a little bit of a tangent. Um, you mentioned, especially you, Congressman Crenshaw, that a lot of the bad rap that nuclear has is because of environmentalists um, spreading misconceptions around it. And, and that's had tangible impacts, right? If you look at the current energy situation right now, Americans across the country are experiencing high gas prices, high energy costs, and a lot of that ties directly to um, energy policy in Europe. And if we look at Germany, uh, the wealthiest, one of the biggest countries in Europe, they decided uh, about a decade ago that they didn't want nuclear energy anymore. Uh, and they said, we'll just replace this with, with the wind and solar power and we'll move away from fossil fuels and from nuclear energy. That's not what happened, right? Instead of producing their own wind and solar to replace nuclear energy, they went to Russia and started importing more fossil fuels from Russia. And that's created this situation right now. 
And so I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on the national security impacts of that. Because obviously, emissions have gone up as a result. Gas prices and energy prices have gone up as a result. But countries in the West are also less secure as a result of what has happened and bad energy policy on nuclear energy. So maybe going from here on down, I'd love to get each of your thoughts on some of the national security implications of supporting our nuclear, indus uh, our nuclear industry and, and the risks of uh, doing what Germany did. So I'll take a, 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 the first stab at that, and others can think of their responses. But um, you know, power, energy, um, uh, food, uh, all of the things that a, a country depends upon for the, the well-being of its, of its population. Uh, as, you, as Americans, we want to have as much control over the sourcing of those things as possible. We have the solutions to all of the, the needs uh, most all of the needs that we need right here, literally under our feet and, and amongst us in, in this country. And we should be utilizing those resources as much as possible. Because Chris, you're, you're absolutely right. We, we can see the future if we make the wrong decisions. Look no further than Europe to be dependent on foreign sources for our energy. And when we have the capabilities right here, we have the know-how, the technology to, to, to produce energy safer, cleaner, uh, more efficient, more efficiently than anybody else in the world, we should be doing that. And as policymakers, Dan one and Dan two, and our, our colleagues, we need to continue to encourage our our, our American energy um, industry to do just that. Otherwise, we will find ourselves at the mercy of uh, of other countries who may or may not have our best interests at heart. I think it's a critical uh, crossroads for us to be able to meet to be making the right decisions as it relates to our energy portfolio. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's two types of security. There's security for your citizens' livelihoods, and then there's this, the security from outside threats. And so your, your, your ability to uh, produce your own energy and have some kind of energy stability and independence is, is pretty critical to, to either of those types of security. Um, Energy is a prerequisite to industrialization. Industrialization is a prerequisite to human flourishing, at least in the modern sense, um, at least how, how most of us think about human flourishing. Um, and if, so if you don't have energy, you, you, will, you will rapidly deindustrialize, and um, your, your human flourishing will decrease rapidly, and therefore your security decreases rapidly. It's a, it's a pretty clear-cut uh, sequence of events there. Um, in, in Germany's case, they, they lost all their leverage. And so when Russia invades Ukraine and, and the, the, the NATO and the United States, we want to put harder sanctions on Russia. We want to, we want to attack their, in, uh, their energy profits that they're getting to fund this war. Well, we've had a lot of trouble dealing with the Europeans on this because now their, their ability to flourish is threatened because they're so reliant on Russia. Now, they've, they've woken up to this. I mean, there's a lot of good news geostrategically uh, that, that comes out of this situation where, where our allies have finally woken up to the, to the reality that, that we never, we, you know, the last 70 years have been kind of a strange time in human history where America has, has created this peace and created this ability for nations to trade with each other in a very safe and secure manner. You no longer have to invade someone to get their minerals, to get their resources, to take their food. You don't have to do that anymore because we can trade. This is a reminder that, that, that that's a very fragile system that has, that has every potential to, to stop happening very quickly. Um, and we have every interest, therefore, in, in making sure that we have energy security. And the United States is in a much better position to achieve that. Uh, I worry a great deal about Europe. And you know, I applaud the administration for saying we're going to increase natural gas exports to Europe by 65%. However, they're taking zero steps to make that happen. So that's a real problem. Um, for, for, our, for our global security. Rich? So they've said virtually all of the wise things to <laughs> say about this. I, I, maybe just the observation I'll, I'll make is, I think conservative policymakers thinking about the energy system and taking seriously the problem of climate change and the desire to reduce the emissions of the U.S. and the global economies. We, I think conservatives tend to think about this a lot more holistically than progressives. So conservatives tend to think about co-equally emissions and affordability 
and security, reliability, resilience, right? I think a lot of progressives really are just entirely focused on the, on, on the emissions. And that does lead, I think, very misguided political movements like the German and broader European Green Party and you know, parts of our own far left progressive democratic base into some very, very strange thinking on how an energy transition ought to be set up. And it leads them to dismiss things like Russian aggression or the incredible problems in the supply chain today mm. of, of solar power and some battery technologies, be that kind of slave labor in Western China, uh, out, outright violations of the trade regime uh, that Dan Tu just mentioned, uh, via dumping and attempting to destroy our domestic solar industry, which even this administration has the kind of hands tied that, well, China broke the trade law, and so you know, we sort of have to stop importing China's, Chinese solar panels in addition to the slave labor. Uh, or things like uh, terrible uh, child labor conditions in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which supplies so much of the cobalt in the global battery system. I think conservatives take all of that very, very seriously. Those are all co-equal problems in our minds. Emissions, really important. Let's get them down as fast as we can. And we can't like, have child labor in the Congo supplying that transition. A lot of progressives have a much more myopic view about that. I think that's a strength of our clean energy movement and our clean energy policy set and approach. I think we should defend that, and I'll be very proud of that. I think it's a much more human and thoughtful way to think about the transition. Uh, and I think it's a way that has a much better chance of preserving our domestic security, the international security of our partners, the global trade regime, and everything else we know and love about the past 70 years of the Pax Americana and, and hope that it'll continue. And obviously, it's not already obvious, nuclear checks, I think, all of those boxes between reducing emissions, being an energy supply that is affordable, done right, especially with advanced technologies, and something that we really have sovereignty and control over virtually the entire supply chain with our system. And so we can really be pretty, pretty clear that it's not going to reduce our, our, our energy security or, or our national security. I guess I'll just add quickly to that. Um, I think one thing that the last several months has really highlighted, it matters who you do business with. When you do business on commercial nuclear, you're really forming a 100-year relationship. You're going to build that nuclear plant. You're going to operate it for 80 years, maybe more than 80 years. You're going to decommission it. So quickly, you form a real geostrategic bond with whoever you're doing business with. And when we just thought about, well, let's just go off and trade, um, actually it really opened the door. And Russia and China have been going about the world, uh, South America, Europe, Africa, saying, hey, listen, I'm going to build that nuclear plant for you. You know, don't, don't worry about it. Um, give you really, really low financing. Uh, I'll take your used fuel. I mean, just offering these deals that are almost sort of too good to be true. And one would ask, well, why were they doing that? Let's just look at Ukraine. That's why they were doing that, right? They want to get you hooked on them. They want to get you dependent on them from an energy resource perspective. And in that way, they can bend your will should they choose to need to do that. And I, I just think let's you know, sort of all now go eyes wide open and say, not such a great idea. So on the, the one sort of lessons learned that we're watching um, right now play out, you have countries now saying, you know what? I don't want to do business with Russia. And so maybe I had that plant we were going to build together, like in Finland, and Finland just said, not so much, canceled that project, right? And so I think we're already really seeing that countries are taking a much harder look. And what's nice about that is that what we just talked about on this panel, the United States is also waking up saying, I think the United States needs to have some stronger leadership here. We have wonderful American technology, some of it already developed, others very much in the pipeline on its way out. And so this is the time for us to really exercise the relationships that we have, bring this clean power and the jobs to these countries, and it does matter who you do business with, and they do want to do business with the United States. We need to be there. A pause.
I think the message from this panel is honestly pretty clear. Uh, nuclear energy is good for the planet, it's good for the US economy, it's good for national security. And I just want to quickly acknowledge, especially for the ACC activists in the room, how lucky we are to have some of the foremost nuclear advocates in this country joining us today, because truly we are the future of this movement. And, and the reason I support nuclear energy, and I'm sure the reason why my fellow panelists support nuclear energy, is because we are environmentalists. We care about the environment, and we see the role of nuclear energy in tackling our challenges when it comes to this. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time uh, for the, the panel discussion, but we'd love to open it up to questions from the audience. Make sure to, um, on Twitter, you can post uh, hashtag ACC Summit, um, and we'll start with the first question, Stephen, if you already have any. Yeah, we've got a lot of good questions coming in, and, and this first one is about how do we capitalize on current competitive, uh, competitiveness legislation to advance nuclear technology, and what would you use to accelerate adoption into the U.S. energy grid? Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> He's looking down one. at the nerds. I have one, <laughs> I have one. Uh, I have one. so, oh, dead battery. Can folks hear me? Oh. Look at this collaboration amongst the nerds <laughs> on this end. Uh, so uh, for, uh, I think the question is probably in relation to the, uh, the, the current uh, conference process on, uh, on, on competitiveness policy that sort of came out of the, in the, in the House, the Competes Act, and in the Senate, uh, what was the Endless Frontiers Act. Uh, it's, it's effectively a whole basket of policies that try to improve our competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Uh, th there are pieces of that policy, uh, frankly, I'm not in entirely uh, thrilled with. I think there's, there's a lot in there. This is a big conference process. I think if it happens, it'll have to be a big bipartisan compromise. Uh, some of the interesting things in there have to do with decarbonizing our industrial sector, and in particular, decarbonizing steel. So there's a very bipartisan House passed bill called the Super Act, focused on decarbonizing steel, and it would set up a demonstration approach for decarbonizing steel plants. One of the key technologies, to, uh, to Maria's earlier point, that we could use to decarbonize steel, because we need a huge amount of heat to do that, are advanced high temperature nuclear reactors. So I think the more we can broaden the conversation about nuclear beyond just supplying electrons to powering steel plants and making low carbon liquid fuels and hydrogen and all those other things, uh, the better and the more competitive we'll be uh, relative to our, um, uh, relative to, uh, to other countries around the world. The only thing I would add um, to that is just in general, we have to look at some of the financing opportunities. When the United States is competing with Russia and China, what it really looks like is an individual company is out there competing with a, you know, a state-owned enterprise, right? So it's not really a fair playing field. Um, and so we just, we just need to take a harder look at how do we make our U.S. companies more attractive and, and even that playing field. And there's, there's a couple of examples uh, of, of that uh, out there, XM Bank, you know, so, some other things. But, but it's really important for us to focus on that. It, 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 real quick, unfortunately, that the, I think the, the bills you're talking about are, are don't do not address nuclear. Um, they also don't address some things I would like them to address, like the the, the materials that go into, say, building semiconductor chips. It, it's mostly focused on semiconductor chips and, and that kind of manufacturing. Um, and but even then, you know, there's there's a lot of inputs that go into that, and if you don't make the United States more competitive in, in mining those inputs and and processing them we're not going to get to where we need to be. And that's a, that's a problem with nuclear. It's a problem with, with all of these considerations if, if we want to be more independent in our manufacturing and processing. And I would just quickly add to that particular point, Dan. Uh, as we uh, want to feel good about ourselves in this country by making some of the policy, policy decisions that we've seen over the last year and a half by, by stopping uh, uh, exploration and mining of some of the critical critical minerals that we need for the clean energy future we all want to embrace, guess what's happening? We're exporting that, um, or, or we're sourcing those critical elements from other countries that don't, don't utilize fair labor standards, that are not environmentally friendly. And uh, in fact, even worse than that, some of the things that we do um, um, extract from the earth here in, in the United States. We ship over to other countries for them to do the, the, the refining and extracting those elements that we want. They send us back the one thing we want, but they keep everything else. 
And so there's so many things that we need to be smarter about in, in uh, this, this whole picture and dependence on, uh, dependence on foreign sources who are not necessarily our friend is a dangerous direction to go. Another question, Stephen? Yeah, there's one more about, um, as we, this is really about clean energy in general. As we transition to clean energy sources, how do we reskill a workforce who maybe was at that former coal plant who's now going to be staffing a nuclear plant? Yeah, thanks for that. Actually, we did a study um, on that or commissioned a study that was done not, not too long ago. And, and really what it highlighted is um, you can actually transition s about 75% of a coal plant's resources directly into a nuclear plant. So just to kind of give you that view, you know, in nuclear, I like to say we boil water a little bit differently. Uh, but once we turn that water into steam, you know, it's a power plant. And that power plant really looks just like a coal uh, power plant. So a lot of those skills, they're directly transferable. There's really not a lot of need. You're talking electricians, INC techs, uh, you know, boilermakers, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, you do need some engineers um, and some folks with, with a different skill set, but by and large, uh, a lot of that workforce. We work directly with a lot of the, uh, the unions and uh, are already talking about, you know, ways that they can ensure uh, that the workforce they have on the fossil side of their business are sort of ready and prepared uh, for work on, on the nuclear side. But I just want to leave you with, it's a very easy transition, not a heavy lift there. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really interesting that, in a way, nuclear energy is also part of environmental justice in that way, right? Exactly. Because it allows communities that are suffering the most from this clean energy transition to have a new economic um, lease of life for their community. And I think that's a, another really cool dimension of nuclear energy. Yeah. Stephen, any, any last questions or are we good? Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you all very much for, for joining this panel, especially uh, our panelists. I'd like to thank Maria, Rich, Congressman Crenshaw, Congressman Newhouse. Um, you guys really are uh, some of ACC's biggest champions on this issue. So on, on behalf of ACC, we'd love to just thank you for, for being here. And let's give them a warm round of applause.